Good morning. Um, I'm presenting a research on the regional value chain for mining capital equipment we did for TIPS uh, last year. I'm going to go quickly through an introduction, uh, some key market dynamics, um, and then straight into the findings, mapping the regional value chains, the nature of regional linkages, and the policy implications. So, the interest for this research actually starts from pure trade data, trade and FDI data. If you look at the amount of FDI uh, stock uh, into Zambia, it's quite impressive. It has been quite impressive. So, it increased from around uh, 4 billion uh, US dollars in 2000, in 2000 to 12 billion dollars in 2012. Um, the Bank of Zambia estimates that in 2012, 9 billion of this FDI stock was actually in the mining sector. So the bulk of it obviously went into mining capital equipment to recapitalize the mines. <coughs> This raises, as for many other African countries, a number of issues in terms of local content requirements and how you can use upstream linkages to actually foster local industrialization processes. South Africa is without a doubt the um, regional hub for mining capital equipment and for associated specialized engineering services. Um, mining capital equipment, uh, as many sh studies have shown, including uh, by David Kaplan, who is here, is the most dynamic sector actu actually in the capital equipment uh, industry. Um, exports, this is industry data from the South African Export Council of, uh, for Capital Equipment. Exports grew from 10 million uh, rands in 2005 to 46 in 2014, so quite significant. If you look at the top 10 export markets, have shown only the four um, the four top here. Uh, Zambia is the most important one. Now, if you look at trends in the past uh, three years, you have the Zambia, DRC, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and if you add Namibia, are consistently uh, accounting for around 50% of exports. Um, if you look at the top 10 exports, you have other two or three regional markets, for example, Botswana. So obviously there's an important story going on here. Um, our research questions were, firstly we wanted to understand what is driving the competitiveness of South African OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, everybody knows, but just in case. Um, the second thing, we wanted to map regional linkages, so to understand how South African-based OEMs strategize uh, in terms of entering the copper belt market. And third, most importantly, what the implications are for local supplier capabilities in Zambia. So what is the impact of having regional linkages on, uh, on, um, on the copper belt? Obviously, there's a big policy question here of what, what is the difference for the copper belt of having South African-based OEMs versus European uh, OEMs or American OEMs. So we wanted to specifically focus on the regional linkages story and obviously the policy implications. So what opportunities going forward? We focused on four product clusters because they were particularly relevant in terms of trade data and because we know from interviews with the um, industry association that the industry association is um, that South Africa is particularly competitive in these clusters. So it's mineral processing, off-road special vehicles, bell equipment, um, not only, but uh, pumps and valves uh, and conveyor systems. Um, I'm not going to go into depth into this discussion, but there are two market dynamics in the global value chain for mining capital equipment that we need to keep in mind. Um, so the mining houses have been under increasing pressures to reduce the total cost of ownership, uh, which means that they don't only look at the initial uh, price of the equipment, at the sales, at the initial purchase of the equipment, but they look at the whole lifespan of the equipment. So uh, what is the duration of the, um, uh, the lifespan of the equipment? What is the likelihood of downtime? Um, what is the accessibility and the quality of the aftermarket services? And that has been driven by a number of reasons, but the first one has been to outsource anything that is non-core activities. Actually, the mining companies are now actually going to the point where they're even outsourcing the actual extraction of uh, copper ores in the mines. So they just want to focus basically on the financial and organizational um, side of the business. Um, 
They've also rationalized their supply chains, so fewer suppliers, more capable, and deeper buyer-supplier uh, cooperation. And this is why you've seen a lot of global alliances with OEMs in the past 20 years. Um, so there have been two implications in, for this, um, in, in terms of these market dynamics. The first one is that the OEMs have become the most important source of innovation in the industry right now. They do a lot of incremental innovation rather than a radical breakthrough um, and a lot of customization to the specific um, uh, characteristics of the mining sites. Um, the second implication is that aftermarket services have become absolutely critical um, for the mines. Um, and that obviously has implication for South African OEMs. So aftermarket services are absolutely critical. And for that, we refer to repair, maintenance, and spares. Um, now, just to give you an idea of the size of the aftermarket services, if you look at mineral processing and pumps, um, the aftermarket sales can account to anything between three and four fifths of, of exports to the copper belt. So it's very significant in terms of procurement values. Um, this is a sketch of the regional value chains for mining capital equipment. I don't know if you can see it, maybe. Yeah. So the mining companies in the copper belt can basically uh, source OEM, um, capital equipment through the OEMs based in South Africa. The OEMs can be either South African owned or international ones, like the Sandvik, the Atlas Copco, the situation. Um, and the OEMs based in South Africa, they do a lot of uh, manufacturing, well, a fair amount of manufacturing actually uh, it's localized in South Africa. In the full report, we go into details and we actually differentiate between South African owned OEMs and international OEMs with a basis in South Africa. But the bottom line is that the South African owned OEMs do a lot more innovation, obviously, um, in the domestic. Uh, they, do an, they undertake a lot of innovation domestically. So there is more control of the IP of the intellectual property, obviously, um, domestic. So it's quite important strategically. Um, South Africa has also a fairly well-developed uh, network of tier two suppliers. There has some previous research has shown that somehow the competitiveness of the network has been eroded in the past 20 uh, years, but I will not go into that. Um, and then the mining companies can buy also through agents and distributors in the copper bed, and this is where the majority of the supply, the suppliers uh, in the copper bed, this is what they do, most of them. They are agents and distributors. So there's been a loss of manufacturing capacities and thousands of suppliers became agents and distributors. Some of them, the so-called briefcase businessmen, don't even have an office. They literally operate out of the briefcase. But others actually have established premises and they are able to provide repair and maintenance services. So we have different levels of capabilities. And then they can buy, obviously, from subsidiaries, so the OEM subsidiaries in the copper belt. An estimate in 2012 um, accounts for 80% of the purchases of mining capital equipment happening through the subsidiaries. Subsidiaries, in theory, will have local tier two suppliers, but as we'll see later, this is a very weak uh, network of suppliers. Um, and then a lot of the, af not some of the aftermarket services are actually done by independent local engineering firms. Um, the mining companies for, can also buy mining, ca mining capital equipment through the engineering procurement, construction and mining and the management firms, which are mostly South African based. Um, and they are um, usually in charge of brownfield and greenfield projects. So as part of that, they also procure um, mining capital equipment. So what is driving the, the competitiveness of the South African OEMs? Um, as I said, South African OEMs do a lot of incremental innovation, um, and they really, it's really a quality-driven supply chain, so they compete based on quality. Um, they are not the cheapest suppliers in the market, and they have been under, obviously, as we all imagine, increasing uh, pressures from the Chinese uh, OEMs. In particular, uh, because the Chinese OEMs are now involved in uh, reverse engineering. So they always, South African OEMs, this means that literally um, the innovation aspects of the business is critical because it gives them an edge um, compared to, um, to Chinese OEMs and also Indians increasingly. 
Um, we saw a lot of lateral migrations of technologies, which we think it's very important, and there is some research on this, but probably it's an issue that deserves more, um, more study. Uh, a lot of the OEMs have been involved, so come from other sectors, or they've moved into other sectors, including electricity, the food industry, infrastructure, construction, forestry, uh, sugar, transport, and even defense. Um, we confirm, um, we confirm what other studies have found, which is that these EPCM firms actually move into the region with their, or with, or with the tapping into the South African supply chain. So they actually move in the copper belt using, to a large extent, South African suppliers. This is obviously problematic for Zambia because the Zambian suppliers are completely cut out of greenfield and uh, brownfield uh, projects. And this is also expected, obviously, in terms of local supplier capabilities, but there is also an issue of really um, the ability of Zambian firms to market their products or be involved in, uh, in these projects. So these are really deals concluded between the copper belt mines, the mines in the copper belt and the EPCM firms here in Gauteng, cutting out the local suppliers. Um, um, South African OEM, OEMs have a particular issue which is, which is very important. Um, their, ex their expansion in the region has been delayed compared to international OEMs. Um, they've started later and they actually struggle to set up um, a value-added presence in the, in the copper belt. Um, so what happens is that an Atlas Copco has been in Zambia maybe from uh, 1940. Um, and a lot of South African-owned OEMs are actually struggling now. Even if they have a significant market in the copper belt, they actually struggle to set up a presence there. Um, that, that this aspect of the aftermarket services will be very important for these businesses because uh, the South African market has been pretty stagnant. So the major opportunities in the South African market are for some aftermarket services, uh, automation, uh, mechanization of, um, of uh, extraction activities um, and low profile uh, and uh, extra low profile uh, equipment. Um, setting up a presence in the copper belt, it's not easy because of the sunk cost um, and because of you know the overheads. So it has been estimated that just for rent and stuff, companies will have to spend around twenty thousand dollars a month, and that's without keeping stock. One of the OEMs reported holding stock worth five million uh, US dollars um, in the premises. So for smaller South African OEMs, these are, these are very significant expenses. And obviously holding stock is the whole point of having uh, you know, aftermarket services in the copper belt because you have to be able to supply within very short lead times. So the stock aspect is absolutely critical. Um, just one, one last thing. Um, the engineering firms reported that one of the reasons why they also supply, okay, <laughs> regional linkages. Um, South African OEMs are increasingly projected towards the region. Uh, this is, the region is particularly important for the mineral processing OEMs. Uh, up to 95% of their sales in the past three years has gone to the region. So for some of them, literally, the region is a lifeline. Um, uh, South, Zambia is also a sub-regional hub for the whole of Central Africa, and in particular for the DRC Copper Belt. Um, and this is very important in terms of the DRC finally offering some larger economy economies of scale for value-added activities in the Zambian copper belt. Um, we've noticed two patterns in terms of the internationalization strategies of the South African OEMs in the region. The first one is a lot of trial and errors. So OEMs reported having, you know, trying with uh, partnerships with international OEMs in the copper belt, uh, trying to look local for local partners in Zambia, etc., and a lot of failure. Um, a lot of it has to do with trust, a lot with supplier capabilities. There are different issues. Um, there is also a progression, usually from direct exports to the establishment of sole distributorships or agency agreements, and for the ones who can afford it, joint um, subsidiaries. Um, so there seems to be really a trade-off, obviously, between the risks involved in externalizing aftermarket services and the cost of internalizing um, these services. 
Um, there is also a struggle on the Zambian side in finding South African partners. So the South African agents, the Zambian agents actually do want to partner with South African OEMs because they feel that would increase their competitiveness in the, and their capabilities in the copper belt, but there is really a mismatch between, uh, between the two sides. Uh, nature of linkages. So what we find is, as expected, actually, it's n obviously not. Um, uh, it was not very surprising. There is a huge differences between South African OEMs entering the copper belt by setting up subsidiaries, and the ones who have joint ventures, uh, sole distributorship agreements, or ag agreements with local agents. Um, the subsidiaries provide lots of support. Um, the OEMs provide lots of support to their subsidiaries through backup services, for example, when there are very uh, skills-intensive uh, repair services, they will fly in staff from South Africa, um, in terms of training, in terms of access to credit, and in terms of joint promotion, obviously the marketing aspect. The training one, we wanted to zoom in. Um, most of it is done in-house uh, and in South Africa, but some of the OEMs some of the OEMs actually move, um, also train, do some training abroad. Very little support for local institutes. Um, in terms of local subcontracting, there is very little. Whether the OEMs uh, work with, uh, jo with the local partners or they have subsidiaries, there, there is very local subcontracting, um, between 10 and 30 percent of, uh, of, um, uh, of the value of the local sales, and it's mostly met small metal fabrication, it's uh, nothing particularly uh, value added. In, there is no R&D budget, of, as expected, in, uh, in the copper belt, very little in terms of product mm -hmm. development. I just want to slide. And this is a critical question. We said there is a lot of customization. So we know that South African OEMs actually travel a lot to the copper belt to customize the equipment to the mining specifications. We asked them whether at least at this stage they will involve the local staff at all. And most of them have said no. So basically, the local staff is just involved in the logistics of it. But there is very little in terms of knowledge transfer. Um, in terms of uh, just sorry, just <laughs> in terms of regional constraints, um, we identified we obviously there are there's a plethora of problems at the national level, but we focused on the regional ones here. Um, the first one is that there are conflicting local content policies. Um, so you have a situation where, for example, the engineering firms are uh, supplying locally um, also because of the local content requirements of the export credit and insurance um, company of the DTI. Um, so obviously, the South Africa has local content requirements, but these are increasingly clashing with local content requirements in the copper belt. And this is not consistent, obviously, with the regional strategies of, of the OEMs. The second issue is that the DRC offers a very important market, um, but it's a very risky environment. So OEMs don't want to set up a presence there. They, want, they are happy to set up a presence in the Zambian copper belt. But the border between Zambia and the DRC is very problematic. So it's making supplying DRC mines very inefficient. So this is the last slide, I promise. <laughs> so there are two key policy implications. What we are saying is that basically, um, these regional linkages offer an opportunity to, to see the Zambian copper belt not only as an export market, um, but to see this regional value chain as an opportunity for cooperation in industrial development. Um, we think there should be two pillars of this strategy, of this regional cooperation strategy. The first one is um, really build a truly regional market between South Africa, Zambia, and the DRC. And that has a whole of issues, obviously, between um, with, the South Africa, with the Zambia and the DRC uh, border and what can be done to make actually that border um, smoother, including participation of the DRC, for example, in a bilateral or uh, the SADC FTA. Zambia is also considering a bilateral. And the second one is, the last one, is in terms of uh, leverage linkages between the South African OEMs and the copper belt suppliers. So we've seen that there are linkages. Um, we think that the current initiatives that the DTI and the Minister of Commerce, Trade and Industry in Zambia are looking at in terms of clusters development should take into account these regional dynamics. And that means, for example, that for the South African clusters, there should be incentives for them to move into the copper belt, um, this process should be facilitated and it should be facilitated for value added activities. And that would be at the advantage of the South African OEMs because they would be 
become more competitive versus the international um, uh, OEMs. Um, but there will be also advantages for the Zambians in terms of employment and skills development. Um, on the Zambian side, this has to be part of a proper industrialization strategy. Um, and skills, it's one of the critical issues they, said they have to look at. Um, as well as opportunity for subcontracting that are now, that are now uh, very low. And we think this is an area where actually the two governments should cooperate and um, complement um, the regional strategies implemented by the privates. Thank you.